quality leadership is critical in all aspects of our lives, from leading a fulfilling life as an individual, to having a functional community, to being part of a thriving nation. Welcome to this special edition of Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. My guest today is Professor Chalitsi Marwala, the Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg, also known as UJ. Professor Marwala is the author of 23 books on artificial intelligence. He is also a regular contributor to The New Scientist, The Economist, Time and Forbes Africa. He joins us today to talk about his latest book, Leadership Lessons from Books I Have Read, the collective wisdom, knowledge and experience from the pages of 50 books. Welcome, Professor Marwala. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thank you very much, uh, Jill, and your listeners. And I am actually looking forward to talking to you. I am so looking forward to this, Professor. So if we look at your thesis for the book, is that the source of leadership is knowledge and that the source of knowledge is experience. In your opinion, how does reading contribute to the kind of experience which in turn lead, leads to knowledge? Well, uh, uh, I'm obviously assuming that uh, the books that, uh, that are written are written uh, primarily from the experiences of their authors. That is the fundamental assumption that you are making. And, um, and, and, and there are many ways in which you can experience uh, the reality of lives. You can, you can have a lived experience. You can be talking to uh, uh, the people who are knowledgeable uh, in the subject. You can be at the workplaces, in our homes, and so on and so forth. So the collective uh, wisdoms that are gathered from those experiences are very often expressed in books. And that is why I decided to go and read these 50 books uh, so that I can share the leadership lessons that uh, I have derived from these books. Okay. And no doubt you've read a great deal more. Uh, I think you read a, a heck of a lot, uh, Professor, in, in, in your day-to-day -day doings. No, absolutely. I mean, I am an avid reader. In fact, as a vice chancellor and principal of the University of Johannesburg, one of my distinguishing aspects of my leadership is that uh, every month I read a book, I invite staff and students of the University of Johannesburg. I even open it up to people outside the University of Johannesburg so that we can discuss a book um, and the theme of the book for next month, which is going to be in November, is uh, on the origins of species written by Charles Darwin. So I am quite uh, an avid reader. Fantastic. Uh, how are the students responding to, the, to this book club? They have actually been responding quite, uh, uh, quite positively. Obviously, for one to benefit from a book club like this one, you have to actually go and read the books. You have to come prepared for the books. And I've realized that there are three types so far of people who come. There are people who have read, who have read the, the book itself. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are people who have read secondary sources of the book. We will read uh, op-eds uh, and reviews of the book, um, uh, or even go to Wikipedia and find out what the book is all about. And then you have the third leg uh, who, 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 who have not read the book at all. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that is not beneficial mm. to them, and also to my reading club. Okay, yeah, indeed. So the book has four sections. I'd like to look at each of these sections and maybe look at one or two examples from each of these sections. So you start, the first section is Africa and the Diaspora. And the very first chapter is on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Now, this is a very controversial novel that was written by a Polish um, author about the Congo and about the way that uh, King Leopold managed the Congo. So I must say, uh, this was the very first book I read, uh, not the very first, but it was one of the books I read in my first year at university. And as a child growing up in a very cloistered apartheid society in South Africa, this came as a very big eye opener to me to see the language used in it, to see the way people were treated, 
um, to that the strong message that came to me was just the horror, the horror. Um, so <laughs> if we can talk about the leadership lessons here. Um, you say that we shouldn't wipe out our past, but we should learn from the past. No, absolutely. Uh, maybe I should just uh, make a confession here that uh, uh, just before I, I went and, uh, and discussed this book of Joseph Conrad, I actually wrote an, uh, an op-ed on the Daily Maverick uh, on, on, on the book. And then uh, after that, I got a response from our former president, uh, Tawon Beiki. And what, what actually ultimately went into the book was, was greatly modified out of uh, the very wise uh, views of uh, President Beiki. So, uh, so basically, if you look at Conrad, Conrad is a controversial figure. He was writing about the Congo as it was experienced as, at, at the time. Uh, his his uh, novel was was based on his experience in the Congo, and if you talk about the excesses of Leopold in the Congo, you will realize that um, there has not been much literature written on it. So instead of crucifying one of the very few people uh, to give us information of the horrible events that happened in, in the Congo. Uh, let us, you know, let us let us look into it. Uh, let us learn from it. And one big lesson that I have learned from from this experience is that um, tackle reality as it is. Don't try to recreate your own uh, reality. Professor, I'd like to refer to the next chapter, um, which is by Chenwa Achebe on things fall apart. Now here you quote right in the beginning uh, a poem by W.B. Yeats and I'd like to just quickly read the first few lines of it. So turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart and the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Um, so the parallel you draw here is the anarchy that was loose with George Floyd. Tell us a little bit more about how Black Lives Matter has influenced uh, our society and um, how we can evaluate how we should adapt and look at crises and how we should adapt to them. Well, absolutely. I mean, obviously, Yeats is one of my favorite uh, uh, poets. And, and the theme of Yeats keeps on repeating itself in this book. So, so basically when the Black Lives Matter came uh, and we saw statues of people of historical significance falling, it, it, it got me to, to ask difficult questions. How do you preserve the history without, without preserving the pain? I mean, that is a very difficult question. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, after the Second World War, um, the, the, the German society uh, um, decided that uh, the statue of, uh, statues of Hitler had no place in their society, and they removed it from the society. Uh, uh, but at the same time, it was important that this horrible uh, experience must not be repeated. And, and the only way you can do that is to, is to erase, can't erase the pain, but is to erase uh, 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 what dignifies, because statutes in, in, in many ways dignifies, what uh, dignifies uh, uh, perpetrator of, of the holo perpetrators of, of the Holocaust, uh, including its chief perpetrator, who was Adolf Hitler. But at the same time, and we don't remove him from our memories so that we can be able to, con to be continuously reminded of what is not to be done. So this, these are the challenges that we face on a daily basis. How do we use our negative experiences to reinforce our positive dreams going into the future? And this is really what leadership is all about. You must learn from your experiences when you are leading a team of people. 
Don't make them go and put their mistakes in a closet because you're not well, you're never going to be able to learn from those mistakes. Allow them to bring it forward. And of course, for you to allow them to bring it forward, it will mean that you are not punitive when people make mistakes. You are reflecting. You are reflective on 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 what what actually genuinely deserves uh, um, uh, uh, correction. Of course, all mistakes deserve correction, but uh, um, the punishment. But at the same time, you want to balance it against uh, uh, the ability to collect information so that you can learn from the experience going into the future. So the next segment uh, section of the book is searching for the ideal polity. Um, also, a, a number of chapters here um, with a number of books uh, that you refer to. I'd like to look at Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Compact. And the social compact, you, you give quite a, a, an interesting discussion here around that. So Rousseau said that um, he felt that the state's survival is the guarantee of liberty. And the social compact is basically for the people to accept the government and to inform the government, and the government in turn providing them security. Um, so can you just uh, explain to me as well what happened here? So the, the first time that this social compact was uh, acted on was during the French Revolution uh, with Robespierre. And then this fell into the reign of terror when that didn't work. Um, so you use the reign of terror as an example it, throughout Africa how things can go wrong. I, I, absolutely. Uh, I, I was listening to, uh, uh, I can't remember who the person was, uh, uh, but he said that um, every great terror uh, has been done uh, in the name of, 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 of noble ideas. Uh, the reign of terror during the French Revolution. And by the way, um, the, the young people who were responsible for the French Revolution were actually motivated by Robespierre. And there are many, many good things that actually came out of the French Revolution. The idea of, uh, of, 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 of removing the monarchy and replacing the monarchy with uh, with a democratically elected uh, um, government, you know, uh, is, 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 is one aspect that came out of, uh, of, 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 of that, uh, of, of that era. The issue of separation of state and um, church and state, obviously United States had already um, started implementing that um, a few years uh, earlier, uh, but it came out of that. Uh, the, the, the idea of us using kilometers and kilograms instead of ounces and, uh, and feet. Of course, the French revolutionaries wanted to remove measurements from, 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 from body parts of, 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 of kings and nobles uh, came out of that. And for those of us who, who study science, it is the most effective way of, uh, of, 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 of studying science instead of using ounces, using kilograms. You know? So... The, 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 the social contract basically says, government, take care of your people. Because if you don't take care of your people, the people actually have a, 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 a natural right to revolt, to revolt against you because you are not taking care of them. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you do when the electricity is not as reliable as it is supposed to be? In a democracy, shouldn't be a violent revolution. In a democracy, that is why every five years, we come uh, together as a nation and employ the next generation of politicians who are going to take care of us. Democracy works when our people are fully engaged and they are, they are educated enough to be able to understand what is, what, is, what is that which is to their best interest without necessarily violating uh, the noble principles of equality and so on. We've only done two segments of the book and there are two other segments that I think are, are, are really interesting. So the next one is on science, technology and society. 
And um, one of the chapters that I found extremely interesting was the one on John Rossman's The Amazon Way on IoT. Um, and uh, you say, you tell in this one, you tell the story of your grandmother making pots and um, the process of drying the pots, the annealing of the pots, and then uh, bringing this in the same AI procedure of simulated annealing. And then you talk about the wringing of the pots so she tests their, um, their strength and their durability. And, um, the se and this is a sensor, sensor network, which we also get in, in artificial intelligence, a wire sensor network. So um, you also bring up the brain implants that, were, uh, that uh, Elon Musk did with his uh, Neuralink. So please tell us a little bit more about this very important um, topic. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, firstly, what I wanted to do there is that science is everywhere. And, 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 and one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we have made as a society in general uh, is, to, is to assume that science is actually in books. Yes, science is in books, but science is everywhere. And we can always learn. We can always learn about uh, many things difficult concepts, whether it is the algorithm, the AI algorithm of simulated and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And secondly, what I wanted to bring to the fourth is that we are, we are actually entering what, are, what is termed the connected world, where our clothes that we are going to, to wear are going to be increasingly wired measuring all sorts of things in our body, whether it is our temperatures, whether it is our uh, electrical conductivity, whether it, uh, it is even our smell. And, and that information is going to be relayed via a sensor network to some big computer somewhere. And that big computer will continuously monitor that information so that if the state of health of our bodies changes, then our doctor is informed immediately to save lives. So that is what the either in which we live in, the connected world. You know? and, um, and, and, and the same process can be uh, taken to monitoring of our electricity network to make sure that uh, faults are, 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 are detected before they happen and prevented. It's called preventative, predictive uh, 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 maintenance that is aimed at preventing disaster. You know? And the same thing can be applied to almost everything. You know? uh, a patient in intensive ward, um, you know, monitoring of our bridges, monitoring of our of our buildings, uh, moni monitoring of our of our production lines in our industries, uh, with the aim of increasing productivity. Basically, this is the world in which if we do not enter into, our productivity is going to fall. Uh, and uh, when it falls, uh, then our society is going to become poor, poorer and poorer. Mm. So the lesson from that, learn and uh, be open to for, for IR and, and be open to all of the advantages of the technology that's coming for Africa to, to grow. If we can go on to the last section of the book, which is on leading nations. So there are a number of very interesting chapters, but I think possibly one that is the best known would be Barack Obama and the promised land. And if you can tell us here about the lessons you got from that, the expectations that we as Africans had from Barack Obama and what he had achieved. Um, you've, you also mentioned that um, there's Obama the phenomenon versus Obama the politician. And which of these two actually made the greatest success? Absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, uh, there's always the biggest criticism of Barack Obama, uh, and I keep on hearing this, is that uh, despite the fact that uh, he was of direct African descent, uh, in the sense that his father was actually from Kenya, uh, his, uh, his activities, uh, his contributions to, uh, to the African continent 
leaves much to be desired. I mean, we know what happened uh, in the in Libya, and I I I, I, I am no great fan of uh, the former leader of uh, of of Libya, but uh, I can I can see um, uh, uh, what has uh, what has uh, what Libya has become now. Um, basically. Uh, 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 is a, a state that is un, uh, highly unstable to the detriment of many of its uh, of its citizens. You know, um, and secondly, if you look at uh, if you compare him to quite interestingly to George W. Bush, and what George W. Bush did in Africa on AIDS, uh, on 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 the uh, 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 Al Gore, you know that uh, that uh, uh, treaty that. Uh, that 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 is favorable to production in the in the African continent, uh, and if you go to places like uh, Ethiopia, you can see how much of, of that has been uh, exploited to expand uh, manufacturing in Kenya. Uh, so 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 Obama, the politician, triumphed over Obama, the phenomenon. The politician is basically a person who just does things because. They are good for his political career, you know, which is really uh, the majority of our politicians. You know, so we have to we have to learn uh, from that experience. But I, I'm not going to downplay Obama, the phenomenon. Um, he is an inspiring man, certainly for many people in the African continent, and uh, for that uh, we are quite grateful. Professor, so um, we've just dipped into a few of the chapters of 50 different books that you look at in this book of yours. Um, and it's, it's been a very interesting taste. I've really enjoyed reading the book and I can recommend it highly to, to our viewers. I want to thank you so very much, Professor Chalitsi Marwala, uh, for taking part in this interview. Professor Marwala is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. And from us, it's thank you for watching. Bye.